Hello there, my name is Barb Owen of Barb Owen Designs, and today I'm going to show you how to make construction paper, fabric paper. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's going to be a fun class, and I think you'll enjoy learning a little different approach to making fabric paper. So we're going to get started. I'm going to show you some examples, first of all, of some of the kinds, some of the end results. So this is paper, fabric paper, made from construction paper. So that's what this is. This is construction paper that's been turned into fabric paper. There's stitching on it. There's all kinds of fun techniques on it. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So this is one example. Here's a different example. Same thing. This is a bigger sheet. This one you can really see the machine stitching on. Fun. And here's yet another one. <clears throat> Again, you can see the, probably see the machine stitching on here a little bit. Again, made from construction paper, kids construction paper, turned into fabric, something you can, can stitch on, cut apart, etc., etc. <clears throat> so, the first thing I'm going to show you is what you need. What are the supplies? Well, of course, you're going to need some construction paper. And by construction paper, I mean the stuff that comes in a kid's pack of paper. That's where you find construction paper, the craft stores, or you know, sometimes you can find it at the grocery store, the office supply store, and so forth. Now, the color that you use the most is white, and that's what this is. This is just white construction paper. It has kind of a grayish cast to it, actually. <clears throat> and... Um, I went to the office supply store or the craft store, I've forgotten which actually, and bought the big sheets of it. It came in a package or maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 sheets in the package and it was 12 by 18. And so that's what I got because I like to make bigger sheets of the fabric paper so that I can, you know, have plenty to work with because I really enjoy making my own papers and fabrics and stuff to use in my artwork. And so the bigger piece, you're going to put just as much time into it, whether it was smaller or big, or the bigger piece. And also in the packages of the multicolored papers, you only get maybe one or two pieces of white paper. So that was another reason I went and bought the bigger packet of just white paper. But get whatever you want to. Then you need something that is oily. <clears throat> and these are called oil pastels. And I'll show you the what it looks like on here. It's just oil pastel. And these come in a great big package. You can spend a little money for these or you can spend a lot of money for these. Now these are not the water soluble ones because there are some water soluble oil pastels or um, oil sticks. These are not water soluble. These are the, the old fashioned, just plain old oil pastel. These happen to be by the company Leo, no, Low. Low Cornell, I think is how you say it. It's either Leo or Low. I don't know. I can't remember how you say that. Anyway, it's L O E W C O R N E L L. That's what this brand is. And um, like I said, this was a great big package of them. This whole entire package, which I took apart and put in this uh, plastic box, this whole package was like eight or nine dollars. So it's not expensive. You're also going to need some uh, Sharpie, the fine point permanent marker. This is black. That's what I would recommend that you have. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use something else, but this surface of this fabric, the fabric paper is rough, and so I would use something that is not really expensive and that you can uh, replace pretty readily because it is rough on your pins and it will wear them out pretty quickly. The other thing I really like to use on this process is the leafing pins and I know that's real shiny but that is the Krylon. This is the brand up here Krylon K-R-Y-L-O-N Krylon gold leafing pin. This one happens to be 18 karat gold. This one is red shimmer. That's what it says here and this one is silver and these are leafing pins. They also, there also is a copper one, and I have a copper one, but it went bad on me. So I don't uh, typically, 
I haven't used it obviously in quite a while because it went bad on me. Some other things you might want to have on hand to use is some, some kind of acrylic paint. Now you can use uh, craft acrylics, which is what these are. Um, all of these are craft acrylic paints except for the tube. So I have an, a variety of brands here and some of them are glitter paints and some of them are um, just plain flat paints and the brand doesn't matter the shininess doesn't seem to matter I do like having some of the shiny metallic finished paints to use as well you can also use the tube acrylics whether they're golden or Liquitex or whatever brands of paint that you have access to. You can also use the Golden Fluid Acrylics or any other of the um, artist grade fluid acrylic paints. These are highly, highly pigmented. They're really expensive. Um, this is fairly expensive too and the tubes, they're highly pigmented so it doesn't take very much paint. Uh, the, a bottle of this goes really quite a long way. Even this little bottle, this little uh, one fluid ounce bottle, this goes quite a long way because they're just really, really pigmented. And then you're going to need some, some kind of a palette. I'm just using a lid, plastic lid. You're going to need a brush. This is a, um, I'm not sure I can even tell you what it is. Three quarter inch is what it says. So three quarters of an inch to an inch across that's that's measured across here for the bristle you can see this brush is well used it's probably a little stiff but it still works some kind of container for water and what i use for my water container is although it's all cruddy and all of that this is the top of, of uh, dvd storage you know when you buy dvds or cds they come on a spindle and this is the top that screws down on top of them to keep the dust off of them. When they're all used up, then I turn that into a water container. And I think that could be all we're going to use for right now. So that's what we're going to do to begin with. Okay, first things first, we've got to put some oil pastel on our paper. And so that's what I'm going to do first things first. And I'm going to use, just picking my colors here. So I'm going to use these colors. And it's a good idea if when you're doing this, when you're starting out, use colors on the color wheel that are kind of close to each other. So yellows to greens or, or you know, reds and yellows, things like that. Use colors that are kind of close to each other on the color wheel. It really does kind of help keep you from making mud. But don't let that stop you from experimenting. So it's fine to experiment. So what we're going to do is on this sheet, I'm going to just do some circles. So just random circles. No rhyme or reason. Just creating pattern, a pattern to begin with. And because this is oily, it will resist the paint that I'm going to put on later. So I'm just putting some suggestions of circles on this. So let me uh, give you a little different shot of that. So that's what we have. Just a bunch of spots on the paper. All right. Maybe we'll just stay here because I think maybe you can see this better right here than the other way. And then when we need a close-up shot, we'll do that. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put, just make circles around the spots that I put on here. Now the idea of this is that we're putting down something that's oily that will resist the watercolor, or not the watercolor, the acrylic paint that I'm going to put on next. You could also do this with any other waxy or oily kind of crayon, whether they're really high quality um, or whether they're kids crayons. 
you can use any of those kinds of crayons as long as it's kind of waxy or oily and it will resist and won't blend with the acrylic paint. That's what I'm after. So on this one, that's all I'm going to do is just simply put color on here. Now you'll notice that there's still a lot of white showing. That's important. You really, really, really want to keep some of the white paper. And it's really easy to completely fill up your paper because it's so much fun. <clears throat> Pardon me, I got a little tickle going in my throat here today. <clears throat> so just put some more color on and I'm just putting a variety of color. I'm not getting too picky. If I go over some colors and I get another color, that's okay. So that's all that's going to happen to this one. So here is our sheet number one. <clears throat> Sheet number one. All right, we're gonna go to sheet number two. On this one, we're gonna use an assortment of colors. And I'm, <clears throat> pardon me, again. I'm gonna kind of think in terms of the rainbow. And on this one, I'm gonna do just a diagonal pattern. So there's red, orange, Again, don't do these too close together because you want to have some white space. Green. Blue. An indigo color. And something that resembles kind of a violet. And then because I've still got a little space over here, I'm going to put some more red, just like that. Now, I've got a lot of white space left, and that's okay, because that's what I want. You don't get too excited about any stage in this process until the very end. You want to just put the color on, keep on going. And then my last, for my last sheet, because I'm doing three of these, and that's usually what I do. When I get into doing these, I usually do three at a time. So on the last sheet, I'm just going to make flowers. So I'm going to start out similarly to what I did on the first one in that I'm just going to do some kind of spirally circles. like so. So I just have some spirally circles going on. And then I'm going to draw some just loose flower petal shapes. And I do mean loose. Nothing, they're not really supposed to be flowers, they're just sort of a suggestion. Just a suggestion of a flower. Like that. Okay, so we've got two colors on there, and it should look like a kid did it. Then you know you're being successful. And I'm going to go with the next color. I'm going to do a uh, kind of a, you know, it's kind of a light aqua kind of color. And I'm just going to echo the petals a little bit. And then I'm going to do, I'm going to echo the petals yet again. Don't try and make this a work of art when you get into doing this stuff. The looser and the freer you are, the better it turns out. And just because I want to have a little bit of yellow in it, and, and by the way, when you want to use these, um, the, the, you can use up these pretty quickly. 
So when you use up the crayon, you just may have to peel it away. Just like when you were kids and you used to have to peel your crayon papers, you'll have to do the same thing on the oil sticks, the oil pastels. So I'm going to put some yellow in here just, just to give it a little more color inside the petals. Just to brighten it up a little bit because it's pretty pastel at the moment. But all that will change as we get going. And as I said, the faster you work, the better you are. Now, if you want to go back into this and add some spots of color, you could do that. Some polka dots. You could definitely add some polka dots here and there. If you have any blank space that's really bothering you, just add some polka dots in it. When in doubt, dot. That's one of my friends told me that. So there we have our three sheets all completely done. So we have the flower sheet, we have the diagonal sheet, and we have our circle sheet. So what I'm after is just kind of a contrast of patterns and designs. All right, now we're going to go back to the circle sheet. And what you'll notice with the oil pastels, if you want to, you can actually get in here and blend them with your finger a little bit. They will blend similarly to the chalk pastels, but they're not nearly as dusty. Now I don't always do this, but we'll do it on this one just for, just to show you <clears throat> that you can do that. So again, I don't want to fill all the space. I don't want to fill all my space up. I just want to have a lot of white spaces left. All right, now you can get a paper towel so you have some handy because the stuff gets on your fingers and so you want to kind of keep your fingers cleaned off a little bit. And what we're going to use is our palette, which is just a plastic lid. And I'm going to put some color on here. So I'm going to start out with, on this one, I'm going to use some of the tube acrylic teal. And you can always add more, but as I said, these paints tend to be a little pricey, and so I'm a little frugal with them. And I'm going to take my water container, and I don't normally put my water in a bottle to use, but just so I can control the amount of water I put it in a bottle just so I, when I bring it over here around the cameras, so I don't have too much. All right, so here is my spot of teal paint. I'm going to thin this down, way down until it's very thin like ink. So it's very thin and runny. You can see how it runs. So it's very thin and very runny. Might even need some more. So it's really, really inky, runny. And then I'm going to paint this on top of, and every time I get more paint, I'll dip it back in the, in the water because the construction paper, this kid's construction paper, just really soaks up. Uh, the water real fast. So you got to keep picking up water with your brush and the wash of the paint. Move some stuff out of the way here a little bit more <clears throat> so you can see a little bit better. And as you go over those oil pastels that we put on here, because they are oil and this is water, you know the old adage of oil and water don't mix. That's exactly what we're after. So this is, and I'm not after making this exactly one color, one shade of color. I don't need to have it one shade of color. Just kind of scribbly is good. Now I'm gonna turn over to the other side here where there's quite a lot of white. And I'm gonna take some of the green gold 
and I'm going to put a little spot of this. Now I'm going to show you the difference. My uh, tube acrylic is right there. There's still a little pile of it. I'm going to put a drop, just a drop, of the green gold. And you can see how intense that color is. Again, lots of water. And what this is going to do is give us a contrast of color, some variety, on the other side of the sheet. I mean, you're going to the, to, uh, the time of creating this, so you might as well give yourself some choices. Okay, and if you get any puddles of water on your, on your sheet of paper, you can just sop them up. All right, so there's one. So you can see why I told you to leave white space, because you want to have bits and pieces of um, spaces where the paint can soak through. If you colored this whole thing with the oil pastel, what would happen is it would resist everywhere and you wouldn't have any place for the color to show up from the acrylic paint. Okay, so there's one. So we're going to quickly put some paint on these other two. And you set, you set the, the damp one aside to dry. So on this one, normally I would use up all this paint, but just for the sake of us being able to move on, I'm just going to wipe it off my palette there. For this one, we're going to use, let's see, I think we'll use this pineapple, which is an apple barrel acrylic craft paint. So shake it up, shake it up, and put a little bit of that out. And you kind of want to clean your brush out, otherwise you'll get a whole lot of turquoise transferred onto this, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, if you want the yellow to really show, then you're going to need to have your brush at least kind of clean. So same thing. Lots of water. To make this real inky and then paint it on. And again, where you see the oil pastel, it is simply going to resist that pastel. The pastel is going to resist the wash of paint. and it's going to soak into the background where you've left the white space. All right, so let's say that we, that's what we want on that one. And let's say we want to do some nickel azul gold on the other part of it, just for something different. So this is the uh, quinacridone nickel azul gold. It's a golden fluid acrylic. So again, this is gonna be real intense. very intense color. It's kind of a brownish, rusty, goldish, brownish. And I'm just mixing it a little bit in with that yellow just because the palette's not very big. So it's going to give us a bit of an orangish cast over here. And the more of the nickel azo gold you put on this, the more orange or brown it's going to get. So I need a little bit more. You can always put out more of the expensive paints, but it's hard on your soul when you use, when you have too much of it left and you feel like you've wasted those beautiful expensive pigments.
All right. So there's that one. So this has a couple of colors on it. And that's all we're after. Just put some paint. So set that one aside to dry. And we're going to go to this one. And again, I'm going to just clean off my palette. And for this one, I'm going to put some pink. And this is Craftsmart Neon Pink. So that's what we're going to use on this one. Neon Pink. And it is bright. That is one bright pink. And paint it on over. And you can vary the shade of pink just by adding more water or less water. But the point is you really want to be able to see that oil pastel resisting and kind of making the paint kind of bead up on it a little bit. And that makes sure that your oil pastel colors will stay present. You know, they don't go away on you. They stay present kind of front and center for you. And you can tell I'm being very brush strokey, technical term. Just paint. You're not trying to blend, you're just trying to get it on there. And this one I'm just going to use the pink all over. Rather than go and add another color, we're just going to put pink on this one. Then those sheets can sit and dry. Um, and it's a good idea to let them dry for a little bit. Because the paper, as the construction paper gets wet, it becomes kind of fragile. So if you get it too wet, what will happen is it will start to peel or disintegrate. So you just kind of want to be a little bit careful. If you have some puddling of water, like you can see some of the water kind of on the surface here, just you can just dab it up. That will kind of help make sure that the paper doesn't disintegrate on you at all. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the first one because it's the driest of the three, and I'm going to experiment or play around with this one a little bit so you can see. As you can see that there are definitely two colors on here. There's the green gold and there's the teal color. Very intense. If you want to put some color, some metallic color on this, which I generally do because I love the metallic colors, you can come in with either the extreme glitters, which are very glittery, or you can come in with these dazzling metallics, which are really beautiful. The dazzling metallics are beautiful metallic colors. So we'll do some of each. We'll do some and some. Now the extreme glitter looks very, very milky when it goes out on your palette. It does not turn out that way at all. Oops. You really have to shake the dazzling metallics up because <laughs> sometimes they don't, sometimes they want to separate out on you. And this one is really wanting to separate out on me. So when that happens, open up the bottle and use something to stir it up. And I'm just going to put it out here in the extender. that it had uh, separated from and clean off my stick. Now I have a dazzling metallic covered pointer. <laughs> oh well. Normally on these metallics I store them upside down and that if that if it's going to separate the clear stuff will go up to the the bottom of the bottle there. But we can just <clears throat> mix it back up into the, the uh, part that it separated out from. 
just mix it back together and then you can use it on your sheet. Now you also, you can paint and do this to your heart's content, which means you could go back over it even with more of your oil pastels or crayons or whatever your waxy surface that you're coloring with. You could put more on here and then go back on top of it with more colors and washes of acrylic paint. Now, from a distance, you may not be able to see this metallic. I'll try and catch it in the light here for you in just a minute so you can really see. That may not look like much of a difference to you at this moment. Let me hold it up and see if I can catch it in the light for you. There you go. You can see it that shine that you see, that intense shine, that's the paint that's on there. That's not just wet. So you can get a really nice um, metallic finish. And that's what these are. They're finishes as opposed to um, gold paint or whatever. It's really a finish that it puts on top of the surface. So it's a metallic finish. All right, so now I'm going to use the Extreme Glitter, which is this which looks very milky and very, very blue until this goes down on your surface. Once it goes down on the surface, then you'll begin to see the glitter. It's a very, very fine glitter and it's really beautiful and, and sparkly in a different way from the metallic finish of the Dazzling Metallics. You can see some of the glitter right there. So it has a definite, it'll definitely make chunks of, has chunks of glitter that start showing up, like right in here. That's, that is the extreme glitter that is showing up. You can see spots of it right there. Whereas this side right here, this is the dazzling metallic which is much more of a fine metal glow, metallic finish glow on the surface. All right, so there is our painted and oil pasteled sheet of white construction paper. So there you go. You can really see some of the metallic shining on there. All right, I'm not gonna do the other two. These two, I would do exactly the same thing with adding metallic paints or additional oil pastel. I could put some more oil pastel on here and then go back over it with additional colors. You can, uh, of the uh, washes of acrylic paint. You just, you just go till you're happy with the result. And I'm really happy with this one. I think this turned out really pretty. So I'm really happy with that. So I'm gonna stop there on that one and move to the next step. So let me get rid of this wet paint so that I don't put my hand in it because that's really easy to do. <laughs> that is really, really, really easy to do. Get your hand in wet paint. Guaranteed, if you don't get rid of it, your hand will get in it somehow. Okay. So let me clean up just a little bit and get rid of my oil pastels, put them back in their little container. I just store these in a, in a box. I don't even know what came in this box originally, but it works great because it held this entire package of oil pastels. As I said, you can use kids' crayons. <clears throat> I just don't use anything that's very expensive to do this because you, it, it's going to get covered up. And so there's no point in using anything that's a high grade of, of art supply here. The less expensive, the better. Okay, so we're finished with paint and water and acrylic paint and oil pastel. So we're finished with all that. 
So now what happens is these need to dry. So these need to completely dry and I would set these aside, you know, I would lay them out separate from each other like this and I would let them dry totally. So you probably want to let them dry overnight just so that they are 100% totally and completely dry. And then we move to the next step. And that is, let me sort myself out here just a little bit. The next step is, to get out your iron and your ironing board. All right, now let's talk about irons just a little bit here. When you're doing this kind of work, play, actually play, you wanna use an iron that is absolutely 100% dedicated to fiber arts, okay? Or artwork in general. So that's what I have here. I'm going to turn it on so we have it up to temperature. And I want you to see the bottom of this iron. See how cruddy that is? And I have actually even cleaned it. <laughs> yep, I've even cleaned it. But it is, that is as clean as this iron is ever going to get. And you're never going to use, I'll never, ever, ever use this on, <laughs> on clothes of any kind. Unless you want your clothes to have art supplies on your clothes. Yeah, so we're not gonna do that. Then we're gonna use an ironing surface. We're going to use an ironing surface. That is covered and protected with parchment paper. So this is my little um, my little ironing board and this is parchment paper that I have put on the surface and in case you don't know what parchment paper is it comes in a box like this and you buy it in the um, grocery store usually. Now some of your um, art supply stores may have parchment paper or they may have something that is similar to this but I think overall parchment paper is your least expensive option to use to protect your ironing surface and your iron and your artwork. So what I do is I use this even on my big ironing board I do exactly the same thing. I put my parchment paper that I folded in half so I have a piece down here to protect the ironing board and then a piece that's going to go over the art to protect the, the surface of the iron as well as my um, artwork. All right. So when your piece of construction paper that you have done the oil pastel and the acrylic washes, when that's all dry, it gets kind of wrinkled up just like this. It's pretty wrinkly looking. And so what I'm going to do with this now is I'm going to put this under, I'm going to sandwich it between the sheets of my parchment paper and I'm going to use my iron that has no steam and I'm just simply going to iron this a little bit to just kind of flatten it out. Now this paper gets really hot and I'm using about a wool setting on my iron. This gets really, really hot just so you know. So handle this paper carefully because this gets hot. And because my surface is not very big, I'm going to have to turn it around and iron the rest of it. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. I gave, you, I gave you the wrong shot. That's what happens when you're trying to do four things at one time. Sometimes I get myself confused. All right, so what that has done now is it's flattened my paper, not totally, 
but it's flattened out a lot of that the curled edges. Okay. So let me show you this one close so you can see that you can see that this has the extreme glitter and some of the metallic paints on it. You can see that shining in the in the light just to give it some texture. A little variety, which is nice. Okay, now the next thing is to turn this into paper. I mean, turn it into fabric. Fabric. It's already paper. To turn it into something that we can stitch on, I'm going to take a very, very lightweight interfacing that's fusible. Okay, interfacing is something that you normally use in your clothes that stiffens edges and it you put it in the center for buttonholes. It stabilizes fabric, but it remains a part of things. And sometimes it's fusible and sometimes it's not. This one is fusible. It has the fusible surface on, on one side. And this little dot pattern on there, that's the glue. So that's the fusible part of the interfacing. So it's really important that you make this sandwich that I'm going to explain to you the right way. So the first thing in our sandwich is we have parchment paper. That's on the bottom. Then we have the fusible interfacing, which is with the fusible side, the dot side, the glue side. That's all the same. Up. Okay? So the glue side is up. I'm going to put my artwork, my construction paper, that I have painted and oil pastel and all that stuff. I'm going to put it on top of the interfacing with the pretty side up. And then I'm going to take a piece of Wonder Under, which is a paper-backed fusible web. Now fusible web sticks is intended to stick two things together. And it is a sheet of heat activated glue. So the glue is on this side and it's not sticky at all but you can feel it, it's rough. And so that is the glue side. And so it goes against the art and the paper is up. Okay, so this is the paper side. So the sandwich is parchment, then fusible interfacing with the glue side up, the artwork with the pretty side up, the wonder under on top of it with the paper side up. And then put your second sheet of parchment paper on top of it. Okay, again, no steam. And this is the wool setting. It's between wool and cotton on my iron. And I'm just watching that I don't go off the parchment paper down here. And I am fusing all these things together. And again, this parchment paper is going to get nice and hot. So when you go to take this sheet of parchment paper up, you're going to lift it up kind of carefully because it is going to be hot. All right, now there's a whole section down here that isn't fused. So we're going to rotate it carefully, making sure that the interfacing stays nice and flat, doesn't get crunched up, nothing gets wrinkled under there. And, and the sandwich is just the same, obviously, because everything, part of it's already stuck together. Put your parchment paper back on the top and then fuse the rest of it with your iron, heat of your iron. Now, as I said, fusible web is meant to stick two things together. That's how it's normally used. Well, in this case, the reason that we're putting it on the top here is because it's going to act like a sealer and it's going to help seal that oil pastel onto the surface and kind of like melt it onto the surface of the paper. The oil pastel never completely dries. It's like chalk pastel never completely stops shedding its dust unless you seal it with something. Well, the oil pastel doesn't ever dry. 
and so you have to do something to seal it into the, um, the paper. And so that's what I'm using the Wonder Under to do that job for us. And then we're later going to put something else on top of this which will further seal the oil pastel in. Otherwise, forever, you could use your finger and you could, even with the, the washes of acrylic on there, it doesn't totally seal it in. And so you could still move it with your finger and that's not good. Because if you're going to use it in projects, you want that to be um, stable. All right, so here is my interfacing. It's on the back of this. So the interfacing is on the back of the construction paper. And now we've covered, totally covered the front of our artwork with the Wonder Under, but now it has a sheet on top of it. And so we need to get the sheet off. So I've talked long enough that it has cooled off because it's important that the paper cools. And then you see if you can get a hold of it. And if you can't, then you're gonna scratch it with a pin. So I'm going to scratch it with a pin to crack the paper and then peel it away from the surface. Now this can take a, a few minutes to do. And sometimes when you start pulling it off, it wants to pull some of the Wonder Under up with it. And I don't worry about that because it doesn't pull up much of it. And once you get it started, once you get the paper started, I peel it back. I don't peel it up, I peel it back. And it has a lot of static electricity in it when you peel it. So you just sort of have to make it leave you alone. And if you have fingernails, you just use your fingernails to pull, get the paper started. It rarely ever peels off in one sheet. Once in a while, you can get it started. Got almost all of it. And the release sheet you can throw away because you don't need that anymore. And pull the rest, work at it till you've got all the release paper off. All right, let me give you a close up of this. All right, so on this surface, we now have the Wonder Under, which you can't, you can still see the glitter and everything coming through. Uh, let me find the place where it was kind of rough. Here it is. I'm going to see if I can show this to you. Let's try it, other camera, see if we can get a. See, if I'm trying, what I want to show you is The place where the surface is not completely flat and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to to show that to you because it doesn't show it very well on the camera but when you feel this there may be spots like there's a spot right in here that is pretty rough and that is because the uh, wonder under here's some of it right here yeah I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to show it there you go Maybe. Yeah, there you go. You can see it there where it didn't completely seal down to the surface. So don't worry about that. Um, you don't even worry about that. I just leave it alone because as I continue to treat the surface of this, it will, that will eventually go away. In the end, you'll never even know that that's, that's um, even there. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add to this. So this is where I'm going to bring in my Sharpie. I'm going to take my black Sharpie pen and I'm just going to doodle on this. Now you can doodle on this as much as you want, as much or as little as you want. And this is where I don't get too excited about things. I just go with whatever strikes me in the moment. 
I tend to like spirals and circles, so I'll just add things. I might even add some just for contrast, add some uh, squiggles. And immediately that takes the whole thing and it starts to sharpen it and give it some more depth because now you've got all of this extra um, color. Black makes everything sharper and cleaner and more focused. So the next thing you want to do is just take a look at it and, and, and ask yourself, do you want any other more... Um, intense colors, spots of black. And perhaps you do. Perhaps you want to put some dots. So you can pick a spot, pick a section and put some dots. And literally, this is a good thing to do in front of the television or while you're listening to music. It's a great thing to do because it gives you that opportunity to doodle and it gives contrast. So it builds contrast in the, the piece of your artwork and contrast is good. Contrast and pattern are good. Now you can do as much of this or as little as you like. And I tend to get started and go, oh, I really like that. I'm gonna do some more of that one. I like that pattern. And in fact, this pattern I've got going on right here, I really like. So I'm gonna do it a little bit more on the squiggles just for repetition. Repetition is also good in artwork. And so I have repeated the spots on my squiggles. All right, so, well, we've got one more up here. Let's spot that one as well. Okay, so we've got that one. Now, you can do as much to this as you wish or as little doesn't matter. It's totally up to you. Now what I'm going to do is I love to go in here and put some metallic gold leaf using the leafing pen. So I'm going to use the gold one. Now these are a paint pen of sort. And so what I like to do, what you really want to do, you can hear that ball bearing. That's mixing the paint. And so you really want to shake that. And then you want to start that paint on something. So if you have a little piece of um, paper, that's great. Take the lid off. And these pens work by depressing the, the, the point to get the paint flowing. Now this is a really ratty pen. It's been used a lot. And so it, uh, it has seen better days, but it's still working. And so when you use this, you can add as much of that metallic paint as you wish. And if you need to get it flowing again, just depress it on a piece of paper. and add some gold highlights. Now, if you wanna add additional metallic highlights, you can use other colors. You just go until you are happy with the result. Now, I'm happy with that. It's okay with me. I don't, at any stage here, I don't get hung up in the way it looks, not in any single stage, so I just, do it and go, yeah, that looks okay. I'm all right with that. 
And now is the part that this is really a stiff piece of, um, still feels pretty paper-like. So this is the part where you kind of pull up your sleeves a little bit and you just take a deep breath because the next part is a little frightening. I will admit it's a little scary. It's a little scary, but you'll be glad you did. So what you're going to do now is I kind of start in the middle here and I'm going to crumple this paper. So I'm going to put my finger in here and I'm just going to kind of scrunch it up like this. Okay, I'm going to, and I'm kind of gentle with it, and then I'm going to open it up, and then I'm going to come from the side, or from a corner, and I'm just going to kind of scrunch it up. And I'm going to come from the other, maybe another corner. And what you're doing is you are bending and softening the fibers of that construction paper and all the pieces that you've put together. The wonder under and the interfacing. You just need to start softening these fibers. And at first you think, this is never going to soften. What is she talking about? But I will tell you something. That the more you do it, the softer it becomes. But you can't do it too much too fast. So see how that's kind of a soft ball? I'm just going to kind of squeeze it little by little. It will eventually squeeze down to where you can get a pretty small ball in your hands. And then open it up. And then pick another direction and just continue to squeeze and squeeze and crumple and squeeze. It makes it's good exercise for your hands. And eventually it will become very, very, very soft. So I have an example of that right here. So I'm going to switch pieces. And I have on top of this some different colors of sheer fabrics on top of this that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But this is obviously another um, pattern. But you can see how very, very pliable this is. Extremely pliable. I mean, it will crumple into a ball really quickly and I can still soften it as much as I want to. Just keep softening. But the more you do that, the softer this becomes and the more fabric-like it becomes. And you lose all of that stiffness that you had in, even though this has started to crumple up, you can still see there's a big difference in these two. This one is very soft, very soft, and it's become very, very pliable. This one is still is very sheet-like, very paper-like. But the more you crumple it, the more those fibers will break down and soften. And then you be get to the place where you have this beautiful sheet of fabric paper. Now, it becomes all wrinkly and, you know, kind of... Um, too wrinkly to use. It's it's too got too much texture in the surface. So I will press this again in a minute and that will help flatten it back out. So that's what we're gonna actually we'll just do that next. So we'll use my little ironing board again. And remember now this has this surface has wonder under on it. So this has that fusible on top. So if you put your iron right on top of this, you are going to be very, very sorry. Because if you put the iron on top of this, it is going to melt this right onto your iron. Because that fusible web surface that we put on there, you can see that shiny surface. Part of that is from metallic paint. Part of that is from the fusible web. That is going to fuse right to your iron. So you've got to always, 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 always 
remember to cover that surface with your parchment paper. So I can put that right on top here and I can use my iron yet again and this will help soften or um, smooth, not soften, but smooth some of those wrinkles out of my sheet from all of the crumpling. Now this is really, really hot. As I said before, this is super duper hot. So you got to kind of let it cool off a little bit. And then you can peel back your top sheet and then turn it around. Now you can see that this is flattened out a lot down here where it's still pretty wrinkly up on the top part that I haven't pressed. But this is flattened quite a bit, so I'm going to put, reverse it, turn it around, and then flatten the top part that I hadn't flattened before with the heat of the iron. This is, I just, no matter how many times I've done this, and I've done it a bunch, no matter how many times I do this, I really, I just love seeing this happen. I love the, the process and just seeing how, just seeing the magic occur. So there is my freshly pressed surface. So there it is. It's all nice and flat and pliable now, but it's nicely flattened out. All right, now the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to put something on the top of this. You could leave it at this stage if you like, and you could go ahead and use it uh, as fabric paper. And it's because it's bright and pretty, you might like that. I'll tell you, I don't care for that. And the reason I don't care for that, although I love the way it looks, it maintains, it has some tacky, a tacky quality to it from the Wonder Under sealer. That because that's what it's acting like is a sealer on top of that oil pastel. So what I like to do is I like to put on top of this some kind of sheer fabric. And so I have a number of color choices here that I'm going to show you how they affect this. Now this is tool and this is black tool. So I'm going to put that on top of this. And this is typically my kind of my go to choice. Um, I put this on the top and, and then I'm going to show you how to do some machine stitching on it in a minute to uh, hold this all together. But I just want to show you the different color choices, just not all of them, but a few color choices. So that's black tulle that I've put on there. So here it is without and there it is with. So it does affect the color slightly. It um, actually has the effect of intensifying the color when you see it. It actually does intensify the color somewhat. So there it is. You still get all the shine. You still see all the gold paint and the metallic paint from below. You still get all of that coming right through that tool. So there's black. So we'll look at that. And then this is yellow. This is a bright yellow tool. So we're going to put that on the surface. And what I do is I just pick one color of tulle to put on the surface or one sheer, one fabric that is sheer on the surface. I don't try in, in uh, combined fabrics or combined tulle. But that is yellow and so that tends to maintain the brightness of, uh, of the color below. So that's another option. So that maintains the color. This one that I'm going to show you now is red. So this is a red tool. And that has the effect of casting a distinctly red hue. So there it is without and there it is with. So without bit more. There it is without the tool and with the tool. So it, it casts a distinctly warm hue, color, tone, whatever you would want to call it 
on top of um, on top of your artwork, your fabric paper. Now this last one that I'm going to show you is one that I just began playing with with this technique and this is called Rainbow Organza and it's an ombre, it's a nylon organza and it, it's an ombre, it goes from yellow to pink to blue and to green and it's a miserable fabric to work with as fabrics go to make something out of it but it is wonderful using in your artwork. Now when you put this on top of your piece of fabric paper it will shade the colors so it has the effect of intensifying yellow, intensifying the pink and it becomes it gives it an effect that you can't get any other way and I'm finding that I like this a lot and so I like this almost as well as I like using the tool. So this is the one we're going to use tonight. So what I'm going to do, remember I said that this, this Wonder Under surface remains a little tacky? Well, we're going to use that to our advantage. So I'm going to put my organza, this is the rainbow, I think it's a sparkle organza. This I got at a craft um, store, actually. It's not, it doesn't tend to be difficult to find. Any place that has inexpensive, it's not expensive, and it's usually readily available. Any place that has organza, a lot of times will have that. And so I'm going to put it under my sheets of um, parchment. So I have parchment below and parchment on top. And I'm going to press it again. Now this is not going to seal it necessarily permanently to the surface. You're going to have to do some stitching to make it permanent. But we can activate that glue, that Wonder Under Fusible glue. We can still activate it and it will act as a temporary bonding to bond that organza to the surface of our fabric paper. Which I gotta say is pretty stinking cool. Now again, the parchment gets really, really, really hot. So kind of cool it off a little bit. Peel back your parchment paper and then you're gonna, and this whole thing is hot, so you're gonna rotate it And on this one, I'm noticing that it melted a little bit into the surface here. So we don't want to, that tells me that either the heat of the iron is too hot or I held it on there too long. So we're not going to hold it on quite as long. Just long enough to stick it together. There we go. Okay, so I'm finished with my iron, so I'm going to put that, remove my little ironing board, and I'm going to move my iron out of our way. Okay, so here is our piece of fabric paper and you can see I think the gradation of color then that's coming from not only all the oil pastel and all of that underneath but it's also coming from the sparkle organza that gives you that kind of shading effect which I think is really cool. Alright the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my sewing machine because I'm going to attach this down permanently with my sewing machine. So it's under my table here so let me pull it up. And we're going to use a couple of different ways. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to stitch this down. Now, I forgot to bring out my slide on table. I sure did. I forgot to pick up my slide on table to go on my machine. So pretending with me <laughs> that I've taken my slide on table, which extends the surface out, makes the bed of my machine longer. That is the ideal. Um, 
we are going to get my machine rearranged here just a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. So I'm using an open toe presser foot, which means it's a regular presser foot. The, um, the toes are open. There's no bridge between these two toes right here. And so it allows me to be able to have a clear visibility right here. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is if you are not comfortable with using your free motion foot, I'm going to show you how you can use your regular presser foot, any regular presser foot, and the feed dogs are up and I'm just doing a straight stitch and I'm going to stitch right on top of this. And what I'm using is King Tut machine embroidery thread. It's a variegated embroidery thread. And I'm using a really long stitch, but it could be whatever length stitch you wanted. And I'm just kind of following one of those lines, not, not totally following, just kind of following it. And remember, when you are working around your sewing machine, use a small pair of scissors. And I'm just going to clip the threads just so you can see. right here, right there. That is where I stitched with that line of stitching. So I will do a few more lines like that and I won't break the thread. Again, I'm just going to kind of follow one of the lines And if you start right at the edge of the fabric paper, then you don't have to backstitch. I just was backstitching because I started a little in a little bit from the, the edge. Now I'm going to stop with my needle in the fabric. And if I wanted to, in order to not have to break the thread, I could just stitch around the edge, intending to stitch on the fabric paper till I got to the next place that I wanted to stitch on a line. So I've just stitched down the side of the fabric paper till I got to another line and then I could just stitch. Kind of stitch on the line. Whether it's straight or curved, I'm just kind of following the line. And then I've gotten to the edge, so I'm just going to stitch down the edge again until I find a new line that I want to trace or stitch on. And then I'm just going to stitch on the line. And then I can just continue to rotate my fabric paper, but you can see now if this was just construction paper, you would not be able to do this. And I'm going to kind of wad it all up in here in the throat of my machine. You would not be able to do this with construction paper, it would start falling apart. But because we have turned it into fabric paper by the addition of the interfacing and all the stuff we've done to it, crumpling it to soften the fibers and everything, we're able to do this. Okay, so that is stitching with the feed dogs up. So you can see all those lines of stitching using the feed dogs and just guiding it as though it were just a regular nice um, stitching. No problem, it's just plain old stitching. Now, the uh, next thing I'm gonna do, and I just uh, need to change my bobbin because I ran out of bobbin thread. So 
So let me get my ring of bobbins here. And this is how I store my bobbins in this ring because then they don't fall out. So I'm going to pull out my a bobbin that I'm going to use and take the one that's empty and I'm going to stick it in there. And that way my bobbins stay in this ring and they don't fall out. Now if I drop this on the floor some of them are going to pop out but it's just a great way to have your bobbins handy and keep track of them. So bobbin thread in and let's change to a different color thread on the top. So I'm going to get my, my uh, little box of threads here and let's use a color, let's use a contrast color so maybe you can see it more. We'll go with this yellow. I think maybe you can see the yellow here. So I'm going to thread up my machine with this beautiful King Tut variegated yellow thread. This is a 30 weight or 40 weight thread. So this is a machine embroidery weight thread. Always thread with your presser foot up so that the thread will go into the tension properly. And I'm using a 90 a size 90 needle. This happens to be an embroidery needle. And that's what I'm using in my machine. And I'm going to take off this presser foot, which is my open toe presser foot. I'm going to put on my free motion foot because that's what I'm going to do now. Now when you use a free motion foot, generally speaking, you want to lower the feed dogs. So the feed dogs are not going to work. I'm going to do the work. So I'm going to put my um, fabric paper back in here. Lower your presser foot. And I'm going to take one revolution of the hand wheel and I'm going to pull up my bobbin thread. Because if you don't pull it up, what ends up happening is you end up with a nest on the back, a thread nest on the back. So I'm going to hold my threads in my hand and I'm going to take a look at what I want to do. Well, let's say that I want to, let's just do some more straight lines, straight stitching. But this time I'm guiding the fabric paper instead of the feed dogs grabbing, grabbing guiding it. So that means that I'm going to move this because the machine can't move it without me because the feed dogs are down. Which also means if I want to go backwards, I don't have to turn the fabric around. I can just simply go backwards because I'm the one that's in control of moving the fabric paper. Now, quite honestly, I find it much easier to watch what I'm doing and come toward myself. So most of the time I do rotate the piece so that I can now stitch toward myself because it's easier for me to be able to see what I'm doing. But here you can see the yellow thread, there's the red thread. This is the, with the feed dogs down, that's with the feed dogs up. You can go faster in a lot of ways when you do it with the feed dogs down because you're not restricted by what the feed dogs are telling you to do. So if I want to go in circles, You can see that I have a circle thing going back here and that's just because I'm able to do that because I'm steering. 
I'm steering the ship. So what you want to think about this, what you want to think here is that the thread up here is the ink in your pen. The needle is your pen. And this, this sheet right here, your fabric paper, is the paper. Okay? So normally, when you are writing with a pen, you're moving the pen. Right? This is the pen. You're moving the pen, not the paper. But when you're doing machine free embroidery, free motion stitching like this, you're moving the paper. Okay? So the analogy of this being ink pen, paper, instead of moving the pen, we're moving the paper. Okay? So let's do that again. So I'm moving my paper. I'm drawing with my paper. And now I'm just doodling. And the faster that you move that machine speed, the speed of the machine, the smoother you're going to get the curves if you're doing a curved motif. So right in here, you can see that my, my circles are not really, they're kind of jaggedy. That's because I was going with a fairly slow machine speed so that you could kind of get the idea of what I was doing. But the faster you move that machine, the faster you move, the uh, the faster you sew, the smoother that those are going to be. Also, what helps make your machine stitching, free motion stitching better is if you draw with your eyes, which means instead of watching where the needle goes, which is typically what we all want to do, we all want to see where that needle is going to go. But if you will draw with your eyes, which means I'm going to follow instead of following the needle, I'm going to be out here drawing ahead of it with my eyes. I'm going to be steering with my eyes way out in front of that. So if I'm going with my eyes, like if I'm drawing a flower, I would be drawing the flower with my eye and the needle just follows right behind where I'm drawing. So that is something that takes some practice, but I think if you'll get into trying that, I think you'll find that that really does help make your free motion stitching a more successful um, and more fun too. It makes it more fun for you to do. So I want to show you a few examples of things you can do with this great fabric paper that you've now created. So we have this beautiful fabric paper. Let me get my other camera here. Let's see if I can get it over the sewing machine. Here we go. So here is the, the piece of fabric paper we were working on just now. So you can kind of see the, the, um, some of the stitching that we were doing. Here's the, the stitching with the feed dogs up. So if you prefer to have the feed dogs up and let the feed dogs guide your stitching, you certainly can do that if you want to get in there and um, practice with your free motion work. You can do that and just play. And let me show you some examples again of some of our stitching patterns and so forth. This pattern I was just drawing, this is free motion, but I drew around here with the thread. And this thread is actually a 12 weight sulky thread. Let's see if I can find the, it says it right up here, which you might or might not be able to see, but that says 12 weight. This is a heavier thread than what I was working with just now. Just now I was working with the um, 40 weight so the higher the number with threads, the higher the number, the thinner the thread. So this is the 40 weight on the bottom. 
This is the 12 weight on the top. You can see there's a lot of difference in the thickness. When you're working with the 12 weight thread, it worked beautifully to do the free motion work, but you must use a top stitch needle. So this is a top stitch needle, and the size that I like is a 90, 14. So a top stitch needle with the thicker threads, and you get some really beautiful, nice, you can really see it right here, what nice stitching you get right there. It's great. Uh, this one is using the uh, King Tut thread that I just mimic the spiral. Let's use this other, other camera over here. I think maybe you can see a little bit better. You can see the spirals there that are mimicking in thread. That's the one that was done with the 12 weight, the heavy weight thread. This one has a combination of the King Tut threads. So the King Tut thread and the feed dogs were working on this and I just did the straight line stitching using the, the feed dogs around here. Then I switched and I went to the 12 weight thread, the heavier thread and free motion and did some scribbling, some doodling in there. So this is a combination. Now let me show you some things that you can do with this great fabric paper when you're when you have created your fabric paper. One of the things you can do after making your sheets of fabric paper, if you have a die cutting machine, which this is a snowflake die, you can put your fabric paper through that die cutting machine and you can actually die cut it into shapes that you can use then in art journaling or for cards or whatever you would like to do with it. So this has been die cut, but you want to make sure that you're using the thick steel rule dies. So these are the thick dies. These are not the wafer thin dies, but these are the thick dies that will stand up to um, the thickness of your fabric paper and so forth. So you can die cut it. So another thing you can do is you can turn it into journal covers. So that's what this is. This is um, this fabric paper right here. So it was a big sheet of fabric paper. And I created a journal cover out of it. So here's the journal. There's the journal cover. I stitched around it with um, to edge it with some yarn and made the, the closure and tied some beads onto the end of it. And it makes a, for a beautiful journal cover. And I stitched right through it to stitch the signature in. And this is actually, there's actually another class um, on how to do the pamphlet stitch. And that's what has been used here is the pamphlet stitch and just hand stitched the signatures into it. But it makes a beautiful journal cover. Here's another journal cover. So this was using um, this sheet of fabric paper. Use this one with the spirals. And this time I made a journal cover that opens from the bottom. And so the, fat, the journal closure, I used a different kind of yarn and edged all the way around and then left the yarn out here at the side and that became my closure over here on the side. So that winds around to hold it closed. Again, another pamphlet stitch, but this time um, with the threads on the outside so I can tie charms or beads or whatever on that. So that's part of that pamphlet stitch, also shown in the pamphlet stitch class. You can also make postcards and ATCs out of it and add an embellishment, capture life's moments. And just, you can, this actually will go through the mail if you choose to do that. Or, you know, most people that, that put their art, put their time into their artwork like this would, uh, will put it in an envelope, but it is the size of a postcard and you may have to put extra postage on it, but you certainly can um, mail your mail art. Or you can make ATCs, which are artist trading cards. 
and that's a smaller size smaller size artwork two and a half by three and a half inches a postcard is four by six and something else you can do with them is you can t make bookmarks so this is a bookmark that I used a piece of this fabric paper so it was this fabric paper that I sliced off a piece and made a bookmark that I attached to black felt or it was a charcoal gray felt I think I stitched just stitched the fabric paper on and added some words that were on a little piece of ribbon that I bought I punched a hole up here at the top I don't think you can really see that but I punched a hole at the top and put an eyelet in there and then tied some fibers onto it and tied a charm through the fibers and then there I have a nice uh, little bookmark so there's one here's another example same kind of thing I use the same fabric paper put a different sentiment with the the ribbon a different charm but otherwise everything else was the same I sewed the fabric paper down to the felt and it became a bookmark and then I had some a scrap of this of this paper left when I squared it up and I had a scrap of this paper left and so I just put them together and put them on a piece of felt that was left over and zigzagged around the edge a couple of times just to give it a heavier heavier look with the thread and first of all I zigzagged this one this piece onto that so I zigzagged the smaller piece onto the larger piece and then I attached the larger piece all in one one go it's been in the room where the cats live <laughs> and I punched the hole up here now you can see the eyelet right there so there's an eyelet that I put in there which wouldn't have to be there it just gives it a nice finish and then put some Rick rack and some fibers through the hole just so you have something to give yourself some um, you know something to stick out the top of the book so there's some bookmarks postcards journal covers so we've got journals we've got bookmarks postcards you can do ATC's you can die cut your fabric paper you can do all kinds of things and you can also cut it into pieces or you can take the little leftovers and you make charms out of it I mean really really and truly the sky is the limit it's just your imagination that limits you as to what you can do with this but I hope you've enjoyed learning how to do a different kind of fabric paper and some seeing some other things that you can do with it you can cut it sew it you can do all kinds of things with it just treat it pretty much like you do your um, any kind of fabric now the only thing you can't do with it is you can't wash it it is not a washable product so you have to keep that in mind with you know whatever you're going to use it in the end result so like you wouldn't want to decorate a jacket with it that you know you're going to wash and that kind of thing so I hope you've enjoyed class today I've had a good time I've enjoyed showing you how to create this kind of fabric paper made from kids construction paper oil pastels and acrylic paint and some um, transparent fabric so I hope you've had a good time thanks for joining me in class today my name is Barb Owen you can find your class notes that accompany this class right beside the video on barbowendesigns.com and I hope you've enjoyed another presentation of how to get creative and it sparks your imagination in how to do some things that maybe you didn't think about before. So I hope you've had a good time. If you have, tell a friend. And until next time, stay creative. And I'll see you next time. Bye for now.